passed in August of 1983, my father had been diagnosed with um, cancer for the second time in, in, in June of that year of 1983. And I had particularly supportive parents, a mom and dad who were always on the other end of the line saying, what do you need, sweetheart? What can we do for you? I remember they moved me down to New York City with a U-Haul. And then, and then three and a half years later, when I decided to move to Los Angeles to sort of better my chances in, in, in television uh, and possibly film, uh, by my agent's recommendation, by the way, because um, uh, I did not want to go to L.A. I'm an, I'm, an, I'm an upstate New Yorker, born and raised. I love the seasons. You know, a sunny day every day is not my idea of the best place to be. But in any case, I was encouraged to go to L.A. And my mom and dad were always supportive. My dad bought a little Dodge Colt. And I, he let me take it across the country and use it for the first few months that I was there. Um, uh, and eventually I gave it back to him and then bought a new car. But he hated to think of me renting a car while I gave L.A. a chance. I was there for six months. I said um, that, that I would stay if I got a job. And wouldn't you know, I got a job in the sixth month with John Ritter to do a little movie, a little television movie called In Love with an Older Woman. I played a young girl at the top of the story that he picks up in a bar. Um, uh, so I had a very small part, but nevertheless, there it was. I got a job, and I had to stay. Uh, I think my next job, by the way, after that was Knight Rider, uh, uh, which was just starting at the time and very popular. But in any case, back to my mom and dad, just, just really super champions of, of all three of their kids. I have an older brother and a younger brother, but particularly of me, you know, seeking such an unorthodox line of work, um, and, and one in which the competition was insane. And uh, so Star Trek was this gift, I mean, just this, this incredible, like, like think of a comet, you know, uh, 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 think, th think of discovering a, a planet or something. It, it, it was this bright light that, 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 that sh you know, shone on us in the darkest, darkest time. My dad eventually died in, in, in November of 1984, but he lived long enough to see the film in June of 1984. And that, to me, was the best thing about Star Trek. And I remember being, Leonard Nimoy being particularly uh, empathetic with me, because he knew, he knew while we were shooting that my father was, was in a, in a, in a, you know, facing a difficult time uh, with his health. And, and he, he was the same age as my dad. And I just really connected with him uh, throughout the course of the filming. He was, he was a very empathic human being and a very um, sensitive man. And uh, that's one of the reasons I chose to feature the picture that I, that I have on the table, because he has his arm around me and, and he's pointing something out. Um, uh, he was just a very, what's the word, a, just a very accommodating, generous, kind, elegant director. I shook his hand the first day of work and I said, Mr. Nimoy, you seem to think I know what I'm doing, but I really don't. And, <laughs> and he, he promised me he would take me every step of the way. He would never, you know, put me out on that limb and leave me dangling there. And he kept his word throughout the course of the, the eight weeks that we worked together. He would, he would have me come and sit just like you are. It's Michelle, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and he'd say, okay, let me hear it. And we'd sit side by side, and I would say the lines out loud with him, and sort of re, you know, re rehearse the scene that we're about to shoot. And and he always was was you know just sort of refining refining my performance to be a little more dry, a little less emotional, no catch breaths, no no you know no kind of kind of squeezing in there with with some sort of emotion. Um, uh, and I was always very grateful to him for that. And the other thing that's neck and neck with with, with ju just how this, this, this good fortune for me impacted my family and my personal life is, is the way, it's, it's like 37 years, here I am with all of you. I'm meeting the most fantastic people and connecting with them. And I've made an incredible friends like Joe Motes. You know, th th this guy reached out to me not long after I was cast, one of the first people, and I was doing conventions and he so so lovingly introduced me to what this was about, because of course my feeling at the time, I was 28 years old, I'm like, who wants me to go anywhere to talk about anything? Like, I, this, I'm not worthy, you know, <laughs> this is not, I can't do this, you know, uh, but, but, you know, the, the, when I first dove in, you know, I realized, oh, this is, you know, you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to be the best comedian, you don't have to be clever, you, you just come and be yourself and, mm -hmm. and bring your heart and, and, 
and and I think that you know that that's what gets me the most about Star Trek is that you just don't connect with people superficially. It's it's always a deeper connection, and a, and I think there's something about us that that we already know each other in a way, you know, without having to talk at all. Somehow, I, I, you know, and maybe you guys have experienced that, but I, I know I feel an affinity for everybody in our universe, so to speak, um, that I might not with a total stranger when I go to conventions. Um, what else have I talked about this weekend? Just how wonderful Leonard Nimoy and Harv Bennett, the producer, were, uh, having been cast, you know, having the role, having been recast with me in it. You know, there might have been a little sort of funniness about that or oddness coming in and playing a part that someone else played, but they just made me feel like I was the first Sabbath that ever lived. So so how could how could that be bad, right? And I apologize, that's my phone. We're oh. gonna ignore it. <laughs> um, uh, that's my phone telling to telling me to shut it off. Yeah, right, right, yeah. I know. Um, uh, anyway, you, you know, it just it just has been nothing but an enormously positive experience in my life. Um, just a couple of months ago, I got this call from a young lady, and she identified herself. Uh, she said, "I'm calling from Cleveland, and I and I um, something about she she worked at a healthcare facility there, or something like that." And I thought, "Oh, this is probably somebody selling me, because let me tell you something. You turn 65, you're 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 going to get like a boatload yeah. of 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 information dumps on you from every insurance company oh, in the country or in the world." And Medicare, it's like I, I could start my own recycling company from just what was in my mailbox from turning 65. It's insane. So I'm just thinking this is another one of those calls to say, oh, we're, we're a company and we offer this kind of care, you know, whatever it may have been. And so, so I called her back and I said, you know, young lady, you, Janet, you left such a polite message and I'm in sales and I know how hard it is to call people um, and sell something. I said, so if you're interested in real estate, maybe I can help you because I am a realtor. But if you're trying to sell me health care, I'm, I'm good. I turn 65 and I got my health care. So, so she calls me back to say, um, Robin, I work in a hospice care place. And, and we have a gentleman here who says he met you in 1994 in Youngstown, Ohio. And you, were, you, you extended yourself to him more than the usual. You were kind and he remembers you. And, and apparently there was a charity auction that weekend, and by the way, that's always the way it is with conventions. There's always some kind of charity that the that the event is supporting. So I think of Star Trek people as the most generous, the most giving, the most, you know, the, the ones that show up and give. Uh, it was never just about being together, but we were always trying to support some 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 kind of need in the community. And this gentleman had been on me for a drink. Um, it was a drink for the auction. And he lost, and he always regretted it. And he was there a week from dialysis. He had stopped dialysis. And he was telling them that I was his last wish. And I said, oh my goodness. I said, what can I do? And she said, well, he's here, and we would like to, we would like to bring you here. And I said, say no more. I will be there. Uh, I said, um, uh, why don't you look into a flight this afternoon? This was a Friday morning. I said, I'll get my act together on my end, and I'll get packed up, and I'll cancel my stuff. And, and so we hung up. And then I, and then I Googled Casanova to Cleveland. It's like a five-hour drive. I called her right back. I go, hold the phone. No need for a plane ticket. I said, I'll get in the car. I said, but I do need a couple of hours to kind of get stuff together here, and I'll be on the road immediately. And I go, and I meet this wonderful human being. You guys, I, I, I got in the car, right? I had everything in the car. I'm like, wait, oh, wait, wait. Let me go in the house. I'll get a Bible. I probably hadn't cracked a Bible in three decades. You know, but I had all the family Bibles in this fun little shelf on, uh, in the house. Um, I have an old, old house in Casanova, so it likes old books and old things on its shelves. And, and I grabbed a hymnal because my mother was a church organist for 35 years, and I thought, if he wants to hear Onward Christian Soldiers, I'm singing it. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and, and nearer to my, got my God to thee and all that. Anyway, and, and I grabbed a cross. I bought this cute little cross in Mexico. I thought, oh, maybe I'll give that to him. Anyway, I get there, and the dude's Jewish. God bless <laughs> <laughs> Craig Berg. I didn't know his name when I got in the car, you know. And, and anyway, we had a wonderful dinner together, um, he was very much still, still well enough to, to be upright on a, on a, um, um, a little, a little motorized, uh, uh, thing, chair, 
and uh, very much cogent and, and you know, the both of us, and this is something I really admired about him, you know, I thought, what's the, I, all the whole way there, I'm thinking, well, what's the point of being there if we don't get right, right to the bone, you know, like, get real with each other real quick. So I asked him, you know, what's your biggest fear? And, and uh, are you rethinking this decision? And, and, you know, because life had just become too difficult to, to deal with every day. He was in such discomfort and such pain, and, it, and the dialysis just wasn't worth it anymore, and I totally respect that. I hope I would have that courage one day if I were faced with, with, with such a uh, monumental decision. And I said to him, you know, with 9-11 having been so recent, and, and, I, and I've always been taken with the people who jumped. I'm sorry if I'm getting too, too, too uh, out there with you guys today, but I said, I said, you remind me of them. Because in that moment, they had such a horrible decision to make. Do I stay and continue to suffer, or do I fly free? And I said, oh my God, Craig, you're going to fly free. You're going to finally fly free. And uh, we talked about everything, you know, his family, relationships, who he loved, who, who, who he loved and lost. Um, what, what, he taught me how to play a couple of card games, because I'm a card player, and he's a card player, so we had fun doing that for a couple of hours. We, we, just, we just connected on every level we possibly could. Um, and, and I spent Friday evening with him, Saturday most of the day, Sunday the morning, and then I had to drive home. And we talked to one another every day. Uh, after I left, uh, uh, I called him, and, and then he, he, um, he died a week later. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I was just so um, utterly speechless and humbled by, by this honor of, of, of being the person that this man wanted to connect with at that moment in his life. And that's, that's Star Trek, you know, without being too corny. It's profound. It's, it's you know, I, I have come to so admire Gene Roddenberry and what he was, what he created um, for the rest of us to just sort of, you know, expound on. Uh, uh, it's, it's like we're all surfers and he created the wave. Um, creation had a convention in, in August, or was it July, August? And it was dedicated to Gene. And his picture and everything he ever said, his most famous quotes, were all over the walls, like one after another. I, and I just stood there. Slack you know, reading these things that he said about tolerance, about diversity, about man and the, and the, and, and, and the way we should be with one another and, and the joy of humanity. And, and, you know, what's not to love about that message? Um, especially in times like these, in times like a pandemic or, or, or you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and realizing, you know, that, that people are being mistreated. People are, you know, do have a legitimate right to, to be counted and to be, and to be um, respected. And, and anyway, <laughs> it's so cute. I'm not the only one with my phone on. <laughs> anyway, um, um, you know, I've had a lot of fun with Star Trek over the years, but, but without a doubt, there, there's just this undercurrent, you know, of just profound connection and love. That, that, that is the basis of it all. Um, and, and I'm honored to be here with all of you today. And, and you touch me, trust me, way more than, than I could possibly touch you. You know, that you show up and you come out and you hang and spend a little time with other human beings today. It's, it means a lot. It means a lot. I'd like to ask a question just to cheer you up. Yeah. What, was, what was your best now, you came in, you, you took over a role, you had all these people who've been working together for decades. Right? Yeah. So you're coming in, and it's like you're, you're there in the voice box. Oh, right? I was scared shitless. So what was, <laughs> your, what was <laughs> your best day on the okay. Oh, gosh, Dave, I don't know if I had a best day. But I, 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 I just think, generally, they, they, they were a very uh, cordial group. And, and cordial is not the right word. Every single one of them, George, Nichelle, um, uh, Jimmy, Walter, Dee, the, the supporting cast, if you will, not, 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 not Bill so much. Um, uh, you know, Bill, Bill was, you know, I really didn't get a chance to connect with him because he was absent, rather, uh, always often in, in, in his uh, trailer. And you know how people say on the late night talk shows, oh, we were like a family. 
Well, it's because you're hanging out most of the time. You know, the work is very brief, and, and, and you know, there are spasms of, of work uh, uh, for five, ten minutes, a half an hour, and then you sit for hours while they're setting up a shot, or they're getting makeup ready, or whatever may be happening. So, so, so I got to know those people a little bit, and I just loved, it, it meant a lot to me that they all kind of knew what they were doing, they had their game down, I was the newcomer, I was the one who, you know, was trying to figure out how, how, to, how, to, how to fit in and play my character appropriately. And, and the way that they each extended themselves to me, to say welcome, to say whatever you need, uh, you know, to, to, to just let me know, we're here, we're here with you, uh, we are a family, well, you know, and, 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 and if there's something we can do to assist you along the way, don't hesitate to let us know. Walter advised me, keep a, keep a journal, and how much do I regret I didn't do that? You know, I was just like, why? You know, and I didn't realize this, this, this experience would, would follow. Uh, that, you know, I thought it was a beginning, middle, and end, and I didn't realize, oh, it was at the end when it really began, uh, you know what I'm saying, uh, uh, so, so maybe my memory isn't so good for some of the, you know, more intricate experiences on the set, but they're a, they're a good, they're, they're, they're a damn fine bunch, and, I, and I'm pr proud to have been just a little, a little, you know, associate, a little person associated with all of them, they're, they're good, good folk. And they protect, they protect the franchise, in, in, in my view. By the way, I think the word you were looking for for Nimoy was mensch. Total mensch. <laughs> oh my god, a mensch <laughs> through and through. Absolutely. For those who don't know, it's, it's Yiddish. It means yeah. human being. Yeah. A real human being. Yeah. Yeah, I, I liked that he was real. Do you know, um, um, he didn't hide the fact that he was sober. He didn't hide the fact that he suffered from COPD, and he, and he wished and hoped for everybody who was a, an addicted smoker to quit. Um, I know quitting smoking for me was hell. I tried everything. A $600 shot in the ass in Beverly Hills. That I didn't want to live, much less smoke. Uh, but, but, I, but I, you know, after like a week, I started up again. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, I was hooked on clove cigarettes, would you believe, guys? Ugh. Cloves. Yeah, for 14 years, uh, and I quit when I was 40, but I finally, I walked into a 12-step room. Can you believe there is, there is a Nicotine Anonymous? And, and, they, and they say, you get smober. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I needed, you know, talking to people who said, oh yeah, I just threw them out the window one day. I thought, that's not me. I am never letting go of these things casually. There was way too much of an emotional connection to them. Uh, for me, and, and it's, I won't bore you with the details. So, so a 12-step meeting, I felt like the people in those rooms. Okay, you're you're kind of, you know, you're as addicted as I am to these fuckers. Um, and and it's interesting too. All the people who gave up everything else first. In other words, the the 12-step rooms for the nicotine and not for the nicotine addicts. These are former heroin addicts, crack addicts, boozers food addicts, everything you can imagine under the sun, they give up cigarettes last. That's how bad it is. That's how bad nicotine is. Um, uh, so, so I'm especially uh, sympathetic, and that's certainly a message I like to send, too, that if you can quit, you, you, you will breathe in your life, you know, like you did when you were young and, and you can't remember anymore. It's so good to get a breath of fresh air, to, to be around people and how, how good they smell and everything tastes better. And, um, you know, and it's good to feel your feelings. A lot of people do what they do, you know, they have addictions because they don't want to feel their feelings. And, and I highly recommend you go ahead and feel them. You're not going to die. <laughs> you're not going to die. You're not going to cry and expire on the spot. You're just going to be in the moment and be real. <laughs> anyway, somebody else? <laughs>